we began a series a few weeks ago entitled When Seasons Change. Now, I'm going to, in a moment, look at a proof text. If you want to get ahead of me, you know, some of you may have Bibles, others may have your devices or whatever, but our proof text is going to be Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. You can kind of make your way uh, to that text. When seasons change, say that. Come on, say it out loud. When seasons change change. The theme of this series is how to prepare for seasons of change in your life. This is lesson number four of a four-lesson series. So we're going to conclude the series today. Now, I want to review just a moment what we said in our first three lessons. In our first three lessons, we said that everything in life is seasonal. Say that. Everything in life is seasonal. We talked about the three categories of uh, change, and we said that there is evolutionary change. We said that there is crisis change. We said that there's visionary change. And so every change falls within that context. Now, each one of these lessons, we've had a subtopic. So in this fourth uh, lesson, this concluding lesson, our subtopic is necessary endings. Necessary Ending. Say that. Necessary ending. Say it one more time. Necessary endings. Will you say it one more time loud? Necessary endings. Now, I borrowed this subject from a business book that I have. It's, it's a really good business book, and the title of the business book is Necessary Endings. It's a business book by Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, I highly re- recommend it, for, especially for people who are progressive and, and people who want to navigate the changes of life. I, I would highly recommend the book. Dr. Cloud, in this book, argues that our personal and professional lives can only improve to the degree that we can see endings as necessary and strategic steps to something better. I thought that was really a powerful statement. Now, don't go to the book and expect to get my sermon. (laughs) You won't won't find a sermon in the book. But it's it's a really powerful book. But I thought it was very appropriate to conclude the lesson. My son, Michael K., he prepared the first three lessons, and I, I wanted to prepare the finale. <laughs> so I, want, I want to do the finale. <clears throat> so this is my lesson. <laughs> Them were Michael K.'s lesson. This is my lesson. Okay. I want to use Joshua and his relationship and his transition, his leadership transition, Moses' leadership transition to Joshua in this text. So that's kind of the the theme we're going to be working with. So in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 11 in the New King James Version, they'll put it up on the monitor, but if you have whatever you have, you can follow along. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, 
to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. So we see in these first two verses, and we're going to read the rest of the verses, but we see in these first two verses that there is a crisis, a crisis. And we've learned that a crisis is something that happens, an event that happens suddenly, and often it is something that happens outside of our control. So for 40 years, Israel has followed Moses. And Moses is special. Moses is, uh, in the world we will say, he's a bad boy. Amen. You know, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, the 34th chapter, it says that there has not arisen a prophet like Moses. It says signs and wonders flow through his ministry to bring the people out of Egypt. Bring them out of Egypt. Signs and, and wonders. And they said never been a prophet like him because he saw God and, and approached God and interacted with God face to face. Special guy, special God. But it's a crisis for Israel because Moses is dead. They had anticipated that Moses was going to go the whole journey. So they got a crisis. Moses is dead. And God is speaking to Joshua but in speaking to Joshua, he's speaking to Israel. And, he, and the first thing he says to Joshua and to Israel, Moses is dead. But he didn't stop there. He said, but arise and go cross this Jordan, the land that I promised. So we got two things in juxtaposition. We got Moses is dead, and Moses symbolizes the past. A wonderful past. A good past. Joshua and his family, Caleb and his family, they had actually been born in bondage, and and they, Moses brought them out of Egypt. And then there were many younger people who were born in the wilderness. And they had seen Moses stretch a rod and the the sea open up and they walk through on dry ground. They had seen a guy who could take his rod and use that rod and water would come out of a rock. He could stretch the the rod when they needed meat. And quails would fly in. He's a special guy. <laughs> he's a special guy. He's real, he's real, he's real special guy. But he's dead. And so no matter how wonderful he was and all the things that he did and all the lives that he impacted, he's dead. So if we go back to last week, they got a decision to make. They can embrace the future or they can protect the past. That's the option that they got. Because Moses is dead, buddy. It was good. We rejoice. We get happy. We thank God, but he's dead, and he represents the past. So God is challenging Joshua and challenging Israel not to forget him, to appreciate him, but don't 
hang out with him. <laughs> you know, you know the Bible says, <laughs> the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 34 that Moses died in Moab. And nobody knows where's grave wall. Mo God bought, buried Moses himself and didn't tell folk where the graveyard. So they couldn't go more day and take any flowers. But listen, if they knew where Moses was, they weren't going to just bring some flowers. They're going to bring some picks and shovels. And, and if we can't get him up out of that grave, what we're going to do, we're going to build a monument. We're going to build houses around it. And we're going to build the city of Moses. But God is challenging them to not protect the past, but to embrace the future. So in verse 3, it says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. So he says, he points out all this land, and he said there are going to be many opportunities if you embrace the future. Because he said, now, <laughs> he's saying, listen, he says, I want you to go over into this land, every place that the sole of your foot shall trail upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. And even though Moses is dead, the visionary is dead, everything God said to Moses, through Moses, still stands. And the reason why everything that God said to Moses, through Moses, to Israel still stands, because Moses wasn't the vision. Moses wasn't the vision. Moses was the visionary. Moses was just a steward. So the vision still stands, and everything that Moses taught them still because Moses was just a steward. He's teaching them, he, he's saying this so that they'll have hope and don't get stuck. He don't want them to get stuck because Moses never was the vision. Moses was just a steward. Moses wasn't the answer. Moses gave the answer. The word was the answer. Right? So even though Moses is dead, the past is over, we still got the vision. We still got the word. Right? Okay, now listen at this. I done got happy, and I'm just in my introduction. No man shall be able to stand before you, verse 5, they're going to be enemies, but they're not going to be able to stand. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. In one of our lessons, we said that everything in life changed. Right? So we need to focus on what doesn't change. So if people change, if roles change, positions change, generations change, times change, age change, we still got something that never changes. God's words never change. God's presence never change. God's spirits never change. Our her inheritance never change. So he's saying now, let's focus on what never changes. And he said, I'll never leave you. Come on, come on. Moses did. <laughs> if yes, he did, he left him. Moses left him. 
He didn't want to leave them, but he left them because endings are necessary. Say that necessary endings. And then he walks, and I'll peruse the rest of it. He walks them through what they need to do. They need to observe what they had learned from Moses. They needed to meditate the word day and night. They needed to not let the word depart from their mouths. Because if they would do that, they would make their way prosperous and they will have good success even though Moses wasn't around anymore. So he had, he had several times he said, but be strong and courageous. Why? Because we're going to have some challenges even in the promised land. Why? Because we ain't in heaven yet. Right? Now, that's my introduction. <laughs> Say necessary in this. Now, listen at this. Let me give you some statements, and, and then we're going to talk about change. And then we're going to look at Moses and look at Joshua. Okay, now listen at this. Change is the law of life, first statement. Then endings are a necessary part of life. When you agree with that. If change is the law of life, then endings are a necessary part of life. Second statement. To get to the next level, you're on. To get to the next level, the level that you're on must be left behind. If you're on one level, but you want to get to the next level, then you got to leave that level behind. How many want to get to the next level? Oh, I know you some next level people. I, I knew that before I asked it. How many want to go to the next level? Well, if you want to go to the next level, then you're going to have to leave the level that you were on behind. Third statement, no one can enjoy the benefits of summer and winter at the same time. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question, and then I'll come back, and I'll give you the answer later. But what if Moses and Joshua had attempted to lead at the same time? Just hold that one. Just hold that one. Just hold that one. What if they had attempted to lead the nation at the same time? So no one can enjoy the benefits of summer and winter at the same time. Henry Cloud said this. I, this literally came from the book. He said, without the ability to end things, people stay stuck. Never becoming who they were meant to be. Never accomplishing all their talents, their abilities that God afforded them, that, that they were afforded. Listen, without the ability to, that's a powerful statement. Without the ability to end things, people stay stuck. Never becoming who they were meant to be. And some people never become what they were meant to be never accomplishing all their talents and abilities should afford them. Here's a power statement. You ready for the power statement? You want the power statement? Listen at this. Better cannot begin until good ends. Better cannot begin until good ends. Ends. Because what Moses accomplished, it was good. But what, what Joshua accomplished, it's better. The promised land was better than anything that they had experienced. 
But listen, better cannot begin until good ends. Which implies that no matter how good a thing is, God has some better. So no matter how good a thing is, oh, the good old days. The good old days. No matter how good a thing is, God has something better. But better cannot begin until good ends. Can we go back to change and let's define change some more? And I want to give you four definitions of change. You getting anything out of this? I think y'all know where I'm going. I think y'all already know where I'm going. Okay. All right. Pacify me and go along with me. Okay, let's, let's go back to change and define it. Change, four definitions, means to move from, and we're going to use the scenario of Moses and Joshua. Change, number one, means to move from. It could be moving from a place a place. It could be moving from a geographical location. The nation of Israel was moving from Egypt, moved to the wilderness, and now God wanted them to move into the promised land. So the word change means to move from. Sometimes it's not moving from a place. It can be moving from a position. It could be moving from a role. Joshua is moving from being the servant of Moses to being the leader of the nation of Israel. But sometimes to move from change is moving from a mindset a way of thinking. Moses was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians, but Joshua was mentored by Moses and trained in the wilderness. So we got two individuals. We got Moses, and he got all this Egypt stuff in him. But we got Joshua, who was trained in the wilderness, trained in the now, trained in what's going on now. Now, Moses knew that, knew that, that Egyptian stuff. That's why he can walk in there and, shoo, shoo, and do all this thing, and all that stuff started happening. Because he was trained in Egypt. He, know, he knew what they believed. Okay. All right. He was a leader in that environment. Joshua was just a kid over there, just a young person over there. He was trained in the wilderness. He was trained in right now. So we have a role change we are moving from one role or position to another, but, but change secondly means an exchange. Say exchange. exchange. That's our second definition. It's an exchange. To replace with another person, another policy, another procedure, and here we see God replacing Moses with Joshua. Third definition. Now, I'm gonna, I, I got a quiz at the end. A test. Okay, so you listen carefully now so you can pass the test. If you don't pass, you're going to have to take it again. I'm not even going to let you go home. You're going to stay in late class until you get this. Okay, I'm telling you, I'm giving you information because I'm going to give you a test at the end of the lesson, students. So the third, defini the third definition of change is to give up something in return for something else. If you're going to have change, you've got to give up something for something else. You're standing in front of the drink machine, soda machine. I don't know what it costs now. Let's say $2.50, $2.50. You got $2.50 in your hand, and you want that soda out of that machine. You got to give up something to get something, right? 
So if you really want the soda, if you really want better, if you really want next level, then you got to give up that 250. You got to give up what you have in order to get something better. Amen. Now watch this. Moses and Joshua were different. Say different. They were different in their personality. They were different in their giftings. They were different in their leadership style. God, that implies that these two individuals were what? What, what, what they, what, uh, don't, don't go there yet, don't go there yet, don't go there yet. They were what? They were what? They were what? Question, why were they different? Not a deep question now. Why were they different? Okay, 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 I heard it. God made them different. So God was intentional, and he didn't want Joshua and Moses to be just alike. God made them different. God made them different in their personalities, made them different in their giftings, made them different in their leadership style because God was intentional. What God had planned for Moses required his personality, his giftings, his leadership style, but what God had planned for Joshua, God gave, gave, gave Joshua a different personality, a different gifting, and a different leadership style so it would match his assignment. So God was intentional. Come on, say God was intentional. Come on, say God was intentional. He was intentional in his deposit, gifting personality, but he was also, get, uh, he was also uh, intentional in their preparation. He, he prepared them different for their assignments. So now, if we're gonna, we're gonna have change, we gotta give up in order to get the change. All right. Listen carefully to me. Moses and Joshua were different in their personalities, gifts, and leadership style. Moses had a shepherding background. He was used to listen to sheep. <laughs> 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 He spent 40 years around sheep. <laughs> Moses had a shepherding background. Joshua had a military background. You'll find it over in Exodus chapter 17. When Amalek came up against Israel, Moses looked at Joshua and said, Now, Joshua, I want you to choose out some men, and I want you to go fight the Amalekites. I'm going to go up on the hill. <laughs> Bubba, I'm going up on the hill. Because I don't have no business down there. So Moses just went up on the hill, took his little rod. Up on the hill, took Aaron and her up on the hill. Joshua fighting that. <laughs> Joshua fight, But it wasn't a big deal to Joshua because he had been trained That's right. That's right. to deal with it. Right? So now listen, they had to give up that shepherding style for the military style. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense? You're following me now? Now watch this. Moses operated through a miracle ministry. Joshua operated through spirit-led strategies and planning and warfare. See, you know, when they got to the promised land, this Moses would have had a very simple remedy. Moses would have said, look at that thick wall up there. Y'all just wait. Give me, let me get set. I'm going to raise my rod, and that baby going to fall. Bam! <laughs> Joshua, he couldn't function like that because he didn't have a stick. You know why he didn't have a stick, a rod? Because God didn't give him one. God didn't give him a rod. So Joshua would have did it totally different. Joshua would have said, hey, listen, guys, here's what we're going to do. I want everybody to hush. 
and I want the priest to be out here in front, and then I want the soldiers to come behind, and we're going to walk around that baby seven times, once a day. On the seventh day, we're going to walk around that baby seven times. Now, all the Moses crowd was thinking, shoot, I can't believe he's telling us to do this. It doesn't take all this. Won't you just take the rod, baby? <laughs> Am I talking to the right crowd? So both Joshua and Israel had to give up their dependence on Moses' leadership style. They had to give up this raw ministry. Fourth definition, the word change means to shift. This is my last definition. I'm headed toward the questions. Get your pen and pads out. We're going to close the book in a minute. Fourth definition, the word change means to shift, to change in direction and emphasis. Remember when the pandemic hit? Churches were shut down. We had to do what? Shift. We had to change the emphasis because in-person wasn't working. So we went to virtual. We did what? Shifted. And it blessed us till we could get back to virtual. And now we got virtual and in person. Israel, oh, listen, please listen. Israel was entering a season in which they needed to act as a military unit to conquer the promised land. God raised up a different kind of leader, Joshua, to meet the new challenge. Listen to me. Please listen to me, precious people. Listen to me. They were getting ready. I'm speaking prophetically now. They were getting ready to enter into a new season. It was different than any season They had experience, so they couldn't compare the seasons because they were different. So God said, nah, nah, this is me. I'm not sure it was just Moses' disobedience that ended his life. The dude was 120, man. (laughs) The dude that been in the game 80 years, folks, come on now. <laughs> Don't he get a trophy at some point? <laughs> but God knew the season changed, and he raised up a leader who could fit the season. Does that make sense to you? Now watch this. Israel had to shift or transition from a civilian mentality to a military mentality. Let me ask all our vets. Vets, let me see your hand. Okay. When you entered the military, did they shift your thinking? Huh? Talk to me. Did they shift your thinking? Yeah. And they took away all that little stuff, how you could do what you want, when you want, how you want. Am I right about it? Right? Right. Okay. So now... Israel need to shift their mentality from a civilian mentality to a fighting mentality. So they needed to shift to a military mentality. They were shifting from spectator to participant. You do it, Moses. You lay hands on me, Moses. You cough, you, 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 you lift up your rod, Moses. They had to shift from a spectator to a participant. They had to shift from manna coming out of the sky to sowing and reaping. Because in this new season, no manna is coming. 
They got a farm. They got a plant. They got to reap a harvest. Israel had to shift or transition from a civilian mentality, a spectator's mentality, manner, and they had to shift from the raw strategy. Now, I'm going to give a statement, and then I want you to close your books because it's going to be test time. Okay, it's going to be test time. Joshua's training, his skill set, his personality were better. Come on, say better than Moses for the new challenges and goals ahead. Now, I'm going to make that statement, and I want to sell it because that's the truth. Now, look at that statement. Joshua's training, skill set, and personality were better than Moses, better than Moses, better than Moses, better than Moses, better than Moses for the new challenges and goals ahead. Got it? Close your books. Close all your textbooks. We're not looking at any notes. Can't look at your notes. Great. It's, it's test time. It's test time. First question. First question. If we could somehow raise Moses from the dead, and present both leaders to the people, which leader do you think Israel would have chosen? Okay, we raised them from the dead, and we're going to give the people a choice. So Moses standing there with his rod, and Joshua standing there with his strategies. <laughs> I got a plan. Okay. Which one would they have chosen, in your opinion? Talk to me. Okay. But let's go back to our statement of fact. Joshua's training, skill set, and personality were better than Moses for the new challenges and goals ahead, but you're telling me they would have chosen Moses. So my question, my next question, because you did pretty good on that one. Why? Why, why, why would they have chosen someone who had, didn't have the skill set for where they were going? Why would they do that? Huh, huh? Baby, you're at the head of the class. This sister right here gets an A+. Plus because they would have chosen Moses because it was all they knew. It was what they had experienced for 40 years. And people tend to choose what they've always knew. And even though what they knew wouldn't even fit, wouldn't even be better, people still would choose it. Would you agree? Okay, now watch this. Another question. Did they know what Joshua could do and how he would perform as, a, as their leader? Did they know? Did they know what Joshua would do? They didn't? Did they know how he was going to perform? Why? Because he had ne never led them. So they didn't know. So it would have been unwise for them to judge his potential because they didn't know. 
because he had never been the leader. He followed Moses. He listened to Moses. And Moses said, go over here, and he go over here. That's all they saw Joshua doing. They didn't see Joshua in charge, so they didn't know his potential. But when we read the book of Joshua, he was extremely successful. So when Moses was alive and leading, Joshua's potential was hidden. So it was necessary for Moses' leadership to stop. So Joshua's leadership could begin. Because endings are necessary. The worst case scenario would have been for Joshua, for Moses to continue. Because they would have had a leader that was equipped for the past, but not trained for the future. All right. I guess I'll give you a passing grade. I, <laughs> I, I, I guess... I guess I will give you a passing grade because you, you started off slow, <laughs> but you picked up, and you were so good at the end, I didn't only have to grade on the curve. You are all passing. You are all graduating. Now, I want to I wanna introduce you to this seasonal change I was talking about. We're going to look at a clip, then I'll come back and talk to you. Faith Chapel was birthed April the 26th, 1981, in the den of my home with four people, a friend, Al Sullivan, my mother, Mary Moore, my wife, Pete, and me. And I have been a living witness to the 41-year faithfulness of God to Faith Chapel. We've come a long way since those early days, and God truly has been faithful. We were able by God to impact over these 41 years, thousands of people locally, nationally, and internationally. God was faithful to his word to give us every willing and skillful laborer. He's blessed us through the years with an outstanding staff, outstanding employees, outstanding vision partners that are committed to the vision. He's blessed us with outstanding facilities. He's blessed us with thousands of members who have heard, believed, and caught the vision and been so loyal and dedicated. He's blessed us with two campuses, a campus here in Birmingham and a campus in Columbus, Georgia. God has truly been faithful. But I believe that Faith Chapel's best days are ahead. I believe it scripturally, and I believe it as a prophecy from God. And this new step in the Faith Chapel journey, our new future begins with the transition of the pastor of leadership of Faith Chapel from me to my son, Michael K. This transition will culminate at the end of the year and the first Sunday of January, 2023, Michael K. will become the lead pastor of Faith Chapel what we traditionally call the senior pastor. He will be our leader. He will be my pastor. He will be your pastor. And I believe prophetically that your best days are ahead, and I'll talk about that later. But scripturally, whenever God makes a change, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he always moves us from glory to glory. 
So Faith Chapel, your best days are ahead. So hey, Pastor Mike, first of all, what we all want to know is that as the visionary and founder of Faith Chapel, are you okay? Am I okay? Yes. Are you okay? <laughs> listen, Mike, listen, Faith Chapel, I am okay about this transition. In fact, I'm excited about this transition, but I'm okay for three reasons, three reasons. The first reason I'm okay, Mike, is because I've heard from God. You know, over the course of my life as a pastor, 41 years of pastoring, I've always wanted to know what God wanted me to do. And I've heard from God about both the transition itself, but I've also heard from God about the timing of the transition. Early in my ministry, early in my call, the Spirit of God spoke to me, Faith Chapel, and he said that he had adorned me with the, the robe of a prophet. He said that I was a prophet called to the nations. He said that I had a worldwide ministry. So I'm simply shifting. No, I'm not retiring. <laughs> That's I'm good. shifting more into that prophetic role, the prophetic call on my life, and specifically in this call and in this phase of my life, I'm called to feed and equip the body of Christ. I'm called by God to develop churches, and I'm called by God. I'm called by God to coach and mentor leaders. I believe these 41 years has been preparation for me to help others. Absolutely. I'm okay, Mike, secondly, because transition is biblical. We see it in the scripture, all through the scripture. We see the leadership of Moses transitioning to Joshua. We see the leadership of Elijah transitioning to Elisha. And then we see the, tra the leadership of Jesus transitioning to the apostles and to the church. Every God-given vision is always greater than the visionary. That's good. The visionary is simply a steward. The visionary is a trustee of the vision. So although the visionary, the steward, me, the trustee, is changing, the vision of Faith Chapel is not changing. That's good. So for 41 years, God has given Faith Chapel a vision. And Faith Chapel Birmingham, nothing is changing in the vision. Nothing is changing. We're simply going to another phase in the vision, another level in the vision, another step in the vision. Faith Chapel Columbus, the vision of Faith Chapel Columbus is not changing. Everything that God designed and eternity to pass, and God wants to happen, intends to happen in Faith Chapel, Columbus, and all the surrounding areas is not changing. Here's what you need to understand. Every God-given vision is generational. In the scripture, we see the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's good. Every God-given vision is generational. God never gives a vision to just one generation. Therefore, if Jesus should tarry, no visionary will ever complete the entirety of the vision yeah. because the vision is generational and transferable. That's good. So I'm okay. I'm okay, Michael. Thirdly, because of what I believe to be your readiness to be the senior pastor, the lead pastor of Faith Chapel. God is a God of preparation. Jesus was called before the foundation of the world to save the world. And at the age of 12, he knew that he was called. We see it in the Gospels. He said, I must be about my father's business. And it, he was 12 years old. Yet he went home with his parents and lived out the next 18 years before he entered the call because God is a God of preparation. I believe 
that you've been prepared. I believe that Michael K. has been prepared. And I introduced this transition to our board of directors some months ago. And I shared with them seven things that I believe speaks to the fact that Mike is qualified. And you know I like seven. <laughs> Michael was raised in a Christian home, number one. And Jesus' preparation began in his home with Joseph and Mary. But Michael was raised in a Christian home with parents who were pastors, and he was taught the Bible in the home. Secondly, his natural academic training in Scripture, there's always a balance between the natural and the spiritual. And Michael has received undergraduate degrees. Michael has received his master degree. So from a natural standpoint, I believe that he's prepared. But thirdly, the mentorship training that he's received. When Michael came into full-time ministry, I was very disciplined. And I knew it was important to not put him over people. I wanted him to learn how to submit to people so that he would know how to lead people. So for several years, he operated without a leadership title, understaffed people in Faith Chapel. And then fourthly, there's the practical side of preparation, the practical side to moving out in leadership. So for years, he led the finance department. For years, he's been the executive pastor of Faith Chapel. And for years, he's led us in strategic planning at our church. All of this is a part of the practical walking out of leadership. And as you know, he served on the, the teaching team of Faith Chapel and have done an absolutely amazing job. But the fifth Sixth and seventh reason I believe that he's ready is so very important. He meets the biblical qualifications of a leader. When we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are qualifications. The Bible says that he that desired the office of a bishop or leader must meet certain qualifications. He must be of good behavior apt to teach, good reputation, rule well in the home as it relates to marriage and children, and he must not be a, a novice. And when I look at my son, he checks the box. And if you look at those qualifications in first chapter, Timoth first Timothy chapter three, you will see that he checks those box. Good behavior. He's apt to teach, and you've heard his teaching give good reputation in the community. Ruling well in his home, wonderful marriage with Michelle, who's also involved in leading in the ministry. Three beautiful girls, my poppy loves and <laughs> Gigi poppy loves. And then he's certainly not a novice. So when we look at the biblical qualifications, he checks the box. But the sixth very important uh, qualification is to have a call of God on your life. And when I go back to the early, uh, my early ministry, I went into full-time ministry in 1985. You were born what year? 1982. 1982. So in 1985, he was three years old. This is my first day in full-time ministry. I'm all by myself, not sure how to do what I'm called to do. And the first person that God put on my heart was to pray for my young baby son, Michael Kenneth. He was three years old. And out of all the things that God could have instructed me to pray about, he instructed me to pray about this little boy who was just three years old. Why? Because he's generational. God saw it in the eternity past that there will be a transition, and God wanted me to pray for this little boy that's three years old. 
I'm not sure why I'm praying. All I knew is he told me to pray. Around six or seven, he's asked all kind of questions, all kind of questions like, why is the sun in the sky? Where did the moon come from? And then out of the clear blue, six or seven years old, he said, Daddy, I know you don't remember, but Daddy, what do I have to do to be a pastor? And I said, Mike, I said, Mike <laughs> you can't choose to be a pastor. I said, you have to be called to be a pastor. He said, okay. He had no clue of the calling on his life, but he was called in eternity to pass, and we have a sensing of that call even at an early age. So through the transition, my growth in ministry, God will quicken him to me. He even called his name out. In prior years, the Spirit of God began to deal with me, and he said that I was passing the torch, and I was passing the torch to my son. I believe that there's a genuine call of God on his life. I believe that he's the heir apparent, and I've said it to you, Faith Chapel Birmingham, for years and I believe God spoke to me and gave me the year. He, he said that I will be 68 years old. I'll be 68 in December. He will be leading the church the first Sunday in January. I believe that there's a call of God on his life. And then finally, number seven, I poured my life into him. I've been pouring my life into him for years specifically in months leading up to this, I'll be pouring my life into him the next six months. And then once he's the lead pastor, I will be off the scenes in terms of leadership, in terms of the church, but I'll always be there to give advice and encouragement. Now, I'm okay. Mm. I said I'm okay, but are you okay? And can you share with us about your call? Yes, um, I'm okay um, because similar to you, I've heard from God. Uh, growing up as a preacher's kid, you hear different people in the congregation, different people who may know you, um, who may call you little pastor or, you know, hey, one day you're going to be a preacher. Um, but you, uh, you and mom never put that pressure on me. It wasn't something that I... Uh, just took upon myself. Um, ministry is fun. Ministry is fulfilling. It's rewarding, but it, it can also be challenging. It's spiritual. Satan um, doesn't want the gospel to get out, so he tries to attack you. So it's in those moments of adversity that you can't stand on what Absolutely. someone else has said about you. Absolutely. You have to know that you've heard from God. So in 2005, when I was away from you all working in corporate America, just in my quiet time, the Holy Spirit quickened Ezekiel chapter two to me um, in my apartment and called me into ministry. Now, what I didn't know at the time, which was ironic, was Ezekiel was the same book of the Bible that when you were in law, law school, the Holy Spirit spoke to you through the book of and Ezekiel. called you into ministry through, through Ezekiel. So in 2005, I knew that I was called to ministry. I did, I moved and transitioned to Birmingham and worked for Faith Chapel a year later but I didn't know whether I was called to Faith Chapel long term. Four years into, three years, excuse me, into working at Faith Chapel, the Holy Spirit quickened Isaiah chapter 45, verse 13 to me. Had no clue what it meant, wrote it down in my journal. But a few months after he quickened that scripture, you began to teach the congregation on vision. And you said that one of the founding scriptures that the Holy Spirit had given you for Faith Chapel was Isaiah chapter 45, verse 13. So I knew in 2009 that not only had God called me into ministry, but Faith Chapel, he had called me to you. He had called me to serve you. Still didn't know that I was called to be a pastor. Eight years later in 2017, he uh, called me uh, to be a pastor. Um, spoke to me and, and told me that, that I was a shepherd. So the process of hearing his voice has been progressive. It wasn't something that I got the full picture of all up front, but progressively has heard his voice and know without a doubt that I'm called to ministry, called to serve you, Faith Chapel, and called to serve as a local shepherd. And you know, a calling like this is so very important. Like Michael said, that you know. Exactly. 
There are so exactly. many places that you have to know that God has called you. But if you think about it, every call requires preparation. Yeah. We're not talking about a moment where I decided that I'm going to shift into another and he just decided I'm going to pass. It was years because God is a God of preparation. It was years getting us to this point and now we're here. And where do we go from here, Mike? So Faith Chapel, there are a few closing next steps that we want to share with you. First, we both want to encourage you to spend time with God. We taught you over the last several weeks about the importance of getting quiet, listening to him whenever you're considering a change or making important decisions, where you attend church, who God is directing to be your pastor is something not that you choose, but something that you want to hear from him. So we want to encourage you first to spend time listening to him. Number two, we want to let you know that we're listening. We've set up upcoming opportunities to get feedback from you to answer any clarifying questions that you have. We'll be sharing more details in the coming days and weeks about how you can um, uh, give us your voice and we can hear from you. And third, we want you to visit a website. We have set up a transition website that can begin to address some of the frequently asked questions that you may have up front. Visit that website. Be on the lookout for upcoming information about some opportunities that we'll set up to hear from you. Know that we love you. Yes. And know that our best days as a church are still ahead. Amen. Okay. I, I want to have, I want to have some closing remarks. I do know that you've been sitting a long time, okay? So I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things, and I want to talk to you for just a few minutes, because this is huge. When you agree, this is this, this big, okay? So to kind of, and you're not, I promise you, I ain't going to keep you here much longer, because beginning next Sunday, Mike is making the announcement in, in uh, Columbus. Next Sunday, for three Sundays, I'm going to share a prophetic word that God gave to the church and to you that your best days are ahead, okay? It's going to bless you. It's going to also give me a little more opportunity to kind of drop some other things because you can't give all the information today, you know what I mean? So, to give me thought. So, if there are some gaps now, and today, I got three more weeks, Sundays, where I'm going to teach that lesson. Mike, for three weeks, is going to teach Columbus on vision. Then we're going to swap up, and I'm going to take the three lessons I taught you, go to Columbus, teach them. Mike going to swap up, come here, and teach you three lessons on vision. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to have you stand, then I'm going to have you sit, then I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes, and then I'm going to let you go, okay? Because this is enough to process, don't you? Is this enough to process? Okay. So stand for a moment. He's not here yet, but I want you to put your hands together and physically welcome him because in the next six months, he's going to be the pastor of Faith Chapel. Will you just, just do that? Be seated for just a moment, okay? And I'm not going to hold you long. I am, I am two things in particular. I'm grateful and excited, okay? I'm grateful for the stewardship that God has given me. For 40, at the end of the year, I would have served as pastor for 41 years and eight months. If you add the little over a year I served uh, as pastor of another church, that's 42 years and eight months. I am, I am grateful 
I have a heart of gratitude. I am grateful to God because Faith Chapel was and is a stewardship. It never was mine. It never belonged to me. The vision never belonged to me. The uh, buildings never belonged to me. All you wonderful people never belonged to me. But God gave me the privilege of stewarding his people. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm grateful to our board of directors, uh, present board of directors, those over the years. I'm grateful to our employees, all those over the years, those who were here, not here. I'm grateful for all the vision partners, just wonderful people uh, that we couldn't do nothing without it. Uh, I'm grateful for you members, and I'm grateful to you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you. But I never, I never embrace you like that, that you belong to me. I told you the word was the answer. My pitch is nowhere around here because it doesn't belong to Mike. You belong to him and the vision. So I, I'm grateful. Uh, and, and you're going to hear me the next six months talk about, about it. <laughs> you know, I'm grateful. Um, but I'm excited. And I'm not just excited about where I am going because I'm not retiring. <laughs> you know, I'm moving over into that prophetic call. But I don't want to talk about that today. Okay, I want to talk about because I got time to talk about that. I'm excited for Mike. I, I really am. I, I, I'm excited because this was not a crisis change. Amen. Oh. Amen. You know, a lot of times when a pastor changed over, the pastor done died, you know, or lied, you know, or. Uh, <laughs> you know, or the folk done fired him because he wasn't, uh, wasn't doing right, you know what. I'm just happy. You know, I'm happy. I asked the Lord to keep me. Amen. You know, I, I asked him. He said I was going to do great things and I was going to prevail. And then a few, uh, a few years back, he said that I did what I, he, I, he sent me to do and I did well. I'm, I'm happy. And I'm happy for him because the change wasn't a crisis. Now, for some people, based on where you are emotionally, I understand the emotions, okay? I have emotions. I'm doing pretty good on all these announcements. I'm, I'm so proud of myself because uh, I had to work on me to not, not boo-hoo all over the place, okay? So emotions are fine. Work through that. It's great. And then if you're excited and just jump up and down, that boy, you know, going to take us somewhere, you know, rejoice in that, whatever, massage it, whatever, uh, emotions are fine, they, they're good, do what you need to do. We're going to work there. You know, anytime I can say something to your questions, anything you want to know, if we don't answer it, then you can fill in the gaps. But this was an evolutionary change. It was evolutionary change. Over, uh, evolutionary change takes time and process and, and stuff. And it involved three things because I have counseled pastors. I have pastors who look at me as a dad in the minister, a father in the faith. Their churches, they, 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 they wanted a covering. They feel like we want you to be a covering for us. So I understand pastoring. I understand how important how important three things are, and I'll give them to you quick. The calling is important. I would never set my son up for failure. Amen. I've seen ministers step over into places and they're not sure. I've seen pastors quit. I've seen pastors go bankrupt because that office is different. Well, all offices are, but that office is different, and you can't step over there if you don't have it. 
It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your family. It'll hurt you mentally. It hurts you emotionally. You don't want to get in there. So he had to, and I had to discern, because the calling is discern. It's discern through time and prayer and revelation. I had to discern my season was over, my season to go somewhere, but I had to also discern his season. This was a stewardship. It was important to me. And he had to spend enough time in God, in prayer, to know he was called to it. There's a calling, there's separation. They're not the same. Apostle Paul was called in Acts 9, separated Acts 13. In between his faithfulness, God looks at us in faithfulness from the call. Some people never get separated. I saw faithfulness. But skill is important in that role. You have to have some skill to be a pastor. You're dealing with a lot of different kinds of things, and skill is developed by practice. So we brought Mike in, and we put him under people. We didn't put him over people, so he was under people for years. Then he ended up over a department. Then next, he became the exec pastor and been the exec pastor for 10 years. He's led us in strategic planning for years. Then we brought him over on the teaching team so that he could develop his teaching gift. But what you may not realize, he's been literally running the church, operating the church for years. I mean, he really, really... I don't know when the last time I've been in a meeting, an employee meeting, and he'd been over the staff. He'd been, I have sit at his feet for years, and he taught me and taught us strategic planning. That's been happening, that's been happening for years. So we, we, we're, we're certain that he's, Worked, practice the craft before you release and lay hands on him. Because once I lay hands on him, I think in December, that anointing going to shift. Everything he got going to be multiplied because that anointing going to shift. I ain't going to have it no more. I'm going to have it for about six more months, so don't be messing around with me. I'm going to have it for about six more months. <laughs> <laughs> like, like yesterday, one of the uh, Columbus members said, what, what am I going to be calling you now? Am I going to call you my ex? <laughs> we broke out last. Are you my ex? <laughs> now, I'm going to be the founding pastor. But the moment I lay hands on him, that anointing to stand in that office is going to shift from me to him. It's going to shift, boy. It's going to shift. But the, the third thing, call, skill, character. You have to care about what you're doing. And I don't have to tell you. You got to care enough to give it your best. I, I can't tell you my story about the time I told him I would fire him. <laughs> when he first came in, he was dropping in a little late. He didn't have a track record yet, but I didn't want him to have one. And I brought him in my office and said, boy, I said, Mike, I love you, but I will fire you. I'm much sweeter now than I used to be. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Am I softer? I ain't, and I'm softer. Okay. But I looked at him and I said, now listen, I will fire you. You keep dragging in here, I'll, I'll fire you. And I meant it. You know why? Because it's stewardship. It ain't ours. And God is watching us. Got it? So I had to watch him to see whether or not he cared about what he was doing and whether he cared about you. Do you care about the people? Sh shepherds have to care about the people. And then God gave me two other things. He said, 
we, we, in regard to leaders, you look for their attitude and are they willing to submit? And I saw an attitude of not pushy, not let me preach. He never one time asked me to preach, not single time. He not one time said, I want to be over there, not one time. His attitude was, I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to help you, Dad. I want to help you. That's an attitude. The ability to submit to others qualify you to lead others. And it took years for us to get to this place. I just wanted to say that so you will understand it. Now, that, that's as far as I'm going to go today. I'll minister Sunday, and we'll do something else. But see this, this, this card here? We created a, a card here, and it says, we understand that you may have questions. We invite you to connect with us. Feel free to visit www.pastor transition.com and we're going to as you leave today you're going to be given a card get this card because now you have an avenue to ask questions get insight get resources we try to put some things for people to listen to what they can be listening to through in this change thing so and then in the weeks to come we're going to have uh uh, a time where we can get together if you want to, to ask questions or whatever. In other words, we're going to give you the opportunity to, to be able to speak to us, speak to me, and we speak back to you, okay? I love you. I know it was a little long today, but this was just important. I need to tell you I was appreciative, and I, I, I love you, and I appreciate you, and I, I need to, to let you know some of what we tried to do with Michael to prepare him to stand in this office. And I'm convinced, I believe it with all my heart, with all my heart, I want you to go back and listen to today's lesson after you've heard the announcement. And I believe every word that I said, that you are going to be better off under his leadership. I believe that with all my life. I believe with all my heart that God is going to use him to take Faith Chapel to another level. I believe that. I believe our best days are ahead because he's going to be my pastor too. Our best days are ahead, and I'm going to begin to teach you that next week.